the essence of interest. We don't want vanilla. We want, you know, we need a little pinch of curry and we need a little bit of uh, a nice, uh, a nice sesame oil there and just not vanilla all the time. You know, tonic dominant, tonic dominant. Dum, 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 hey, dum. well, on that subject, Andy, I had to also say the group and your musical world has embraced consonance and dissonance. And this is an important it's thing. thing. It's, it's the same thing. Same, same thing of what? It's, the, it's, it's all on the table to eat. What do you, what do you want? What, I want a ni little nibble of consonance there. Maybe a bit of that consonance from over there. Oh, oh, you know what? I want some dissonance. Um, that's uh, Yeah, it's like salt and pepper. It's like sauce. You can't have a whole diet of dissonance because it's, again, it's like a whole diet of vanilla. Who'd want it, to, it's, it's too much flamethrower. You know, let's, let's, it, it, but it, it's, it's all, you know, that works, that works, that works, that works, and that, and that, and that, and so on, you know, it, it's, it all works. Why it has to be tonic dominant, tonic dominant. Now, we come on, let's let, to learn the bass. We no, could do an hour with you just doing guitar lessons. I, I've I've steered my students in many cases to your video guitar lessons. There's a part. Uh, the well, they weren't lessons. I got, I got caught in a hotel room in New York while I was uh, promoting um, Wasp Star, and this this guitar paper called up and said, "Look, if we bring a, a, a guitar." which wasn't my guitar. People say, hey, he plays a, you know, he plays a red squire. Well, I do play a squire at home, but mostly I play um, uh, an Ibanez artist. But uh, they, they just came over to the hotel room and plonked down this thing and said, here, have a guitar, talk about guitar playing, you know. Which was very but, useful. It's, it's really, I'll tell you something, something from the, the jazz world that, that was really influential for me. Oh. And this... This, I think, has occurred all over the place, especially in early XTC, is this interval. Do you know East Broadway Rundown by Sonny Rollins? Yeah, of course. It's, it's got that lovely um, <laughs> harmony. And, and the riff is... Uh, <laughs> That's a fantastic interval. Fourth, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's all over C. Yeah. Right. And I heard that and it was like, why can't that be in pop music? Why is it stuck in the jazz ghetto? Why, why can't it come and live in in bubblegum music. Why can't and you're it doing be? that right out of the gate on, on white music and uh, go to. Yeah, it was just, I, I was puzzled why all these flavors weren't acceptable in the sort of cooking that we had to eat. Why, why can't we have dissonance in, in a two minute song? So it was a palate thing for you at the end of the day. You want, you want all the options on with the big canvas. Yeah, I, I, I why restrict yourself? I mean, there are there are benefits to restricting yourself sometimes. Absolutely. And then other times it can be the death of you. You know, the Ramones painted in two colors. Uh, and initially that was really thrilling. But then it it really wore really quickly, wore out very quickly. And you just That's wanted, the Ramones, you know, you wanted the Ramones to make a, a slow acoustic record. Yeah. Or, or Joey not to sing and play an oboe or something. And, and you know, you wanted it to, um, to grow. Because, uh, like I say, I get bored quickly and, and I don't want to be doing the, exactly the same thing, the next record and the next record and the next record. But to me, I, I couldn't see why, why it all had to be split up into, into these, these ghetto. So what are your favorite sci-fi films? Well, I don't think anything really ever beats 2001. You know, I, I saw that when it first came out, it was in Cinerama, the wide, you know, vision and stuff. We went to see it three times and within about three weeks. 
and the, with the cheaper seats, which were right at the front. So one was in the middle, one was at the left, one was at the right. It's a totally different film. It's fantastic. Uh, I just, and the colours, that sort of sequence at the end when the, all the lights come towards you, we just, yeah, I just love that. I thought it was fantastic and kind of copied it a few times since. And we did Domino on stage. We kind of used a bit of that effect. I, I just, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. That's, that's probably my favourite. I mean, I can't think of what else I, what else ones I like really. I mean, the Star Wars stuff is all fun, you know, but I, it's it's a, it's cowboys in space. It's not cerebral. I like things with a bit a bit more thinking about them, I suppose. And so, the Matrix type stuff is more interesting, and some of those kind of films. How about the, uh, one is the, the peak? Just because it, it was visually so good, and the use of music was brilliant as well. So the combination was was stunning. Oh yeah, the uh, the Ligeti during the uh, monolith. Scene. Yeah, all that, but also the first, you know, the opening, the Richard Strauss piece, you know, which kind of become such a cliche but when the first time we ever saw that it was just stunning you know i mean this this effect you know it um it was just it was amazing so that that kind of lives with me and um i think the music was such an important part of that film as you say ligeti and, and also the and all the bits were good you know all the, all the music in it was good uh i was exposed to a science fiction soundtrack at the age of five unwittingly unwillingly <laughs> Uh, my mother took me to see Planet of the Apes when right. it came out in 68, mm. thinking it was a nature film. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and so Jerry Goldsmith's sound world could have been the most frightening part of the whole thing. Right. You know. It was a good film. At the time, I enjoyed the film at the time. Um, I mean, you know, the, I was... Yeah, well, in a sense, this, the end was a surprise, I think, because you didn't necessarily think that was going to happen, I don't think. And, and you know, that, so that was, you know, that's that's it's advantage of not being history, you know. You don't know and what you know, And you know who wrote that ending? Nope. Rod Serling, Twilight Zone. All right, okay. So he was one of the guys that came in for the script, and then um, actually there's the Italian Planet of the Apes poster back there. Right. I'm a big fan. Um, so soundtrack composers, were, were they of interest to you? Yeah, I think soundtracks are, are crucial to films. I mean, obviously, that used existing film uh, music, the 2001, but well, Ennio Morricone obviously becomes is the one one would always bring forward. I mean, I mean, he wrote beautiful music, like for the things like The Mission and all the rest of it. Uh, but, you know, to, the ability to write for the uh, spaghetti westerns, you know, particularly the good, the bad, the ugly. It's just, you know, I mean, it's just something so un unlikely, you know, for a, for a composer of that kind to write. And it's just, that's what the film's all about. You know, I mean, the film is, it's a good film, but it's the music that makes it completely, I think. And it's true of the other two spaghetti westerns, I think. Yeah, there's this thing, I mean, you know, what else? I mean, a lot of people I like um, uh, out of Africa, the, those are great themes, you know, and then... Um, Dr. Shivago. I mean, you know, when you hear these kind of themes, they conjure up the the the, the film so effectively. I think that, um, and these things do influence one. I think. And the thing about film music has to have a degree of simplicity about it normally in order to be memorable. Um, you know, if you can't, you can't go anywhere. So sometimes when you hear the music out of context, it can sound not not as powerful. But um, within the context, another film that I love the music for was um, particularly comes to mind is Picnic at Hanging Rock, um, which used the pan pipes and an organ. Really, it was all, all the music was, um, and the piece, I think the pieces were written especially for that film. Very evocative. Um, those are the kind of things I think when it's you, know, you can do something a little bit different, it, it, it's really good. Did you enjoy uh, Bernard Herrmann on the Hitchcock stuff and elsewhere? So I got a bit of noise for somebody, somebody there. Um, well, give me some examples of films there. Well, uh, Day the Earth Stood Still. Right. Uh, okay. Psycho. Yeah. Uh, Taxi Driver. Right, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, it's, it's, I mean, it's a name I know without really having really particularly focused on, on the music, you know, I suppose. That's interesting anyway. because he was also, you know, a British classical composer. Right, yes. Well, a lot of these guys were. I mean, Richard Rodney Bennett was an English classical composer. And his classical music is fairly unlistened to all, but his music for something like Far From the Bandy Crowd is brilliant, you know, in my book. Anyhow, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not terribly into sort of, you know, what, as soon as I like the, I like, I'm not terribly into music that's too discordant, you know, so kind of, 
I know. How, how, were you a Vaughn Williams fan? I love Vaughn Williams. Yeah, I mean, you, again, very variable. I think capable of the most beautiful music and sometimes rather rather trite music as well. But I mean, that's you know everybody is, I suppose, really. But I think it's his Fifth Symphony. I think it's just just wonderful piece of music, you know. Um, so yes. I had this conversation with, with Ian McDonald, who, who was with C King Crimson, of course, and he said, yes, we used the Meltron, that's all we had. And I thought, that's all you had? What are you saying? You know, that's, um, yeah, that's Mars and Pluto together. Yeah, you've but, got But they had, they had Fripp. Yes, of course. Yeah, Robert, um, uh, extraordinary. And... Um, um, Crimson were, were an extraordinary band, um, you know, conceived and birthed in an era where most bands were trying to be Hendrix or Cream clones. Um, we were all guilty of that. And then Crimson come along with a band of guys, all of whom read music, um, who were using this broad-based approach, eclectic, Boring from jazz, boring from rock, folk, fusion, all of that. Um, I came up with the term collision some years ago, and and I'm glad that some of it's gone into common parlance. But collisions are things that shouldn't really coexist. I mean, there are those who say that as soon as it's electric, it's not jazz anymore. But um, I'm no purist. I'm I'm all for fusion, collision, and um, and sticking it all together, yeah, yeah. Please, please do. You know that that's great, isn't it? You know, it's it's so, it's a heady combination. And when we talk about, you mentioned the knife and also hogweed. Things get very heavy, and I'm wondering. Well, the, you seem to have been an early guy to really go very heavy in a post Hendrix world. I mean, obviously Tony Iommi, and there are guys yeah. that you know a Page, but you're there pretty early. Um. I I realized that, for instance, if you played complementary sounds, like for instance, the end of the return of the giant hogweed, um, Tony uses Mellotron brass, which is a pretty distorted sound in the first place, at high volume. I played power chords behind it um, at high volume. So the fusion of the two was, um, in, a, in a small place. In those days before my, my, my amp was mic'd up or direct inject, it was, people would either say to me, I couldn't hear a note you played all night, or you were absolutely deafening because I was standing in, in, in line with your directional, um, with your stack. So there was no way to really be able to mix yourself satisfactorily at that time. Um, again, the learning curve was, yes, you know, things that are mic'd up, things that are in the PA, you don't need to play that loud from the stage. What was your pedal board at that point? Um, well, initially, it was just a couple of things. I had a, a, a Marshall Super Fuzz and then a Color Sound, uh, a Macari's Color Sound. I also had a Rose Morris, uh, it was just a, a, a duo fuzz. Shaftesbury Duo Fuzz, it was called, and that had a sort of high upper harmonic in it. Um, I sometimes used them in series, the two, the two fuzz boxes. You couldn't do that very loud; it would scream and feedback. But if you, if you contained it, if you held back, you could get very high, uh, high, um, and you could get sustain out of it until it would die horribly, of course. And uh, you've got to figure out what. What was a safe length to hold notes? Um, and then, so I, I had a volume pedal. We got it put into a, a pedal board. Um, it was Pete Cornish who really did that successfully. And I had an octave divider. And by the time I was using an Echoplex, um, suddenly I felt that I could produce my own sounds. I was using a high watt. I think it was a 100 watt high watt at the time. It was very clean, and very loud, very clean. Um, and um, uh, it gave me studio sounds that I thought, yep, you know, with this echo, I can either have slap echo or, or long stuff to do solos like um, Further Fifth. 
Um, I had a wah wah as well, but I hardly ever used it with Genesis except to make uh, the wind noise on um, by turning off the, the pickups and using the sort of white noise from it. And, the stuff that you hear on that nice down on Broadway. Uh, oh, is that that's but, you on Ravine? Yeah, on Ravine. That's right. Yeah, doing doing that noise. That was just um, that was the guitar. Well, there's an example of what guitars can do. I mean, for instance, if you play a note and you get it clean and you're just fading the note in, it can sound a little bit violinish. Of course, um, it was one of the first things I did when I got hold of a volume pedal. Um, so. Guitars don't always have to go bang. This is a very geeky question, Steve, but did you ever see Steve Hillage play with the glass rod? I don't think so, but uh, but he but he's a fine guitarist and, and uses some very unusual sounds. Yeah. Yeah. It struck me that, you know, when Paige went with the bow, it seemed like people were, were realizing that it's, it's not just a guitar. It's a kind of synthesizer now. It's a kind of instrument. Yeah. yeah. I used to use a bow with it before, it sounds crazy, before Jimmy Page was using it, but I didn't have a context to be able to use it professionally because it wasn't until Genesis. One of the first conversations I had with Pete Gabriel, I said, you know, was shunting it backwards and forwards and made it sound like a steam train. And I said, I said to Pete, um, what if we started a show in darkness? And then you find out that it's the, uh, it's the guitar that's doing this, this thing, getting faster and faster. Um, wouldn't be the first time a band had emulated um, that. You know, drum drummers have been doing that with brushes as a, you know for, for quite some time. Um, but it's still a great effect. I've said this about his singing, and yes, he could whistle bebop. I'll never forget him blowing smoke circles. You know, we all smoke cigarettes, and he'd do these smoke circles, and he'd whistle bebop through the circle. I mean, it was unbelievable, like a, a magic trick, you know, circus yeah. act. Really unbelievable. When he was relaxed and he was on, he was amazing. That's why it, I'll say this. I don't think he was ever recorded how well he could really sing, ever. Maybe early on in the first, before I was in the group. Um, and he could have used his imitations of people were just so dead on. Uh, Bob DeRoe. I mean, what? <laughs> That thing in his voice, you know what I mean? That, you know, uh, who was the guy that did word jazz? Uh, Ken Nordine. Yeah. Uh, and then Teresa Brewer, where he'd do that little hiccup thing in his voice, whatever. And he could do that shit. And when he was relaxed, sitting there with a cigarette, he could sing his ass off. So controlled and so dynamic. And he was so uptight when he sang everything in the studio. It was very disappointing. I mean, people, so I hear it is less than it could have been only because of how talented he was and how sharp he would sing and when he needed to be in tune. Trout mask, no. Decals, maybe sometimes on certain things, and he did. He was fine with those things. But by the time, the time, by the time of Clear Spot, it was like, uh, you know, you need to, you were, were, these are simple things. This is a little R&B thing. You need to be in tune, dude. And he could do it, but he just couldn't because when his energy level went up, is he got tight and every, everybody has a problem. And so that's where that mental dysfunction starts showing up. But in a, in a rehearsal setting or in a relaxed setting at the home, to what degree is the whistling or the singing of musical ideas imparted to the band? Whistling was. Uh, singing things too, yeah. And graphic ideas, just descriptions, all of those things. He'd whistle apart and he could, he could retain that. He, he'd whistle away and, and uh, the descending part in uh, Lick Mighty Cows, da, 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 right? I was thinking of descending, but it's actually ascending. Um, he whistled that. Uh, oh. Okay. As, but I don't remember really specifically. I just remembered there was a lot of parts in whistling. And even in the Trout Mass tunes, he would come out, he'd come running out of the bedroom in his robe and go, no, do this because he could hear what we were doing and we'd sculpt things after the fact. Brilliant, actually. I think that's a really, really would be a great organic way to deal with players. You know, I mean, with your chops and your, the jazz background or creative music background, where you're playing with really great players, that stuff almost just happens instinctually because of their level of musicianship. We weren't those guys. But 
I think there's something about a naive player that when you do it in a sculpting thing, to change it in a rehearsal where bands make sounds rather than hired guns, you know? And I even think that in the jazz world. I, I really liked a lot of the bands that were bands, you know? You know, it's just there was something cohesive that would happen with a group of people that stayed together for a while and toured. It is. It's a, um, it's a kind of group mindset develops. You, you know each other. You're comfortable. I mean, the, the relaxation that comes with being, with trusting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can relax. Yeah. You can trust that somebody is, is going to follow your idea. Right. So in a certain degree, uh, you have Beefheart really kind of editing what you guys are doing in real time. Right, yeah. Which, which I think is really good because it, it, this is his overall creation. Did he know the exact parts? Hell no. But so what? The only problem is, is claiming that you do. Okay? <laughs> That's the only problem. So doing that in that way, I had no problem with the idea of that he did this. He was a, a, a very much in control of the overview of this. But, you know, it's, it would be nice if when you're dealing with human beings, it's not AI, it's human beings. You just be a little nicer about it. And initially, it was right after Cage had died, and I wanted to do a kind of an homage to him. So the, the basic piece, um, the, that first part, um, was very formally constructed using chance methods and using chance methods to extract text from Cage's writings. And, you know, in other words, it's, it's all based on his approach, um, but seen from my point of view. Um, and it's very formally constructed and has um, non-musical ideas. Like it's, it's got influence a little bit by cinema Foley techniques. So there's a, in that piece, if you're gonna do that live, there's a big, tray of gravel and somebody has to walk in it <laughs> um you know things like that and that i think was um very clear uh a approach that reflected my approach uh, i learned so much from cage and so it, it reflected that and what did you learn from cage what how was cage in in inspiring to you I read Silence when I was a student back in 767 or so, and it was a revelation in a way that, first of all, a serious composer had a sense of humor. That was good. <laughs> um, but more, it was a question, it's, in a, it's a strangely polemic book in, in you know, a contradictory way, but uh, the idea that the building blocks of music are whatever you want to make them be. So taking away the whole training about notes and harmony and melody and, uh, and going beyond the contemporary music thing of duration and amplitude and, the, you know, they broke it down into those things and he broke it down like, you know, why you don't need an instrument. You know, it's, it's more like what, how do you choose the sounds you're going to make for your piece and how do you decide when something's going to happen and all of that had a very big impact on my thinking about musical form and structure. So I started experimenting with uh, ideas that I got out of reading Silence back in Henry Cow days, you know. So there was that. On the, on the other hand, there was the fact that he apparently didn't like improvisation. So that I found interesting. And I found it interesting also because, and I tried to have a conversation with him about it because I met him a few times over the years. Um, he came to see a concert I did with Joël Léon um, and came afterwards to say how much he'd enjoyed it. Yeah, he would show up at concerts. I remember this vividly. Yeah. I would sit next to him at roulette. I would yeah. see him. He would go to improvised music concerts. He seemed perfectly fine and into it. But then I was also at college doing a cage festival and we were presented with all the chance operations and all the, f the ways of formulating these scores. And he was really against the fact that we had put so much personality into it. Right. And that we right. had, you know. So that, that's, that, that's the root of his um, distaste for improvisation, but it's also, I think, based on a cultural observation. I mean, there wasn't really an improvised scene outside of jazz when he was talking about it. And it's clear that jazz has got nothing to do with what he's trying to do. It's been made out that he's racist because of that. And I, I don't buy that. 
Um, I think it's much more philosophical about how you tell your story. Um, and he doesn't want you to tell your story. He wants something to happen. Um, and I, I always wanted to engage him in a conversation based on the fact that in the meantime, between 1950 and even 1980, but certainly now, uh, improvisation has completely transformed itself. Um, it's no longer a, in any way um, idiomatically predictable. And there are so many different strands of it and the skill sets that people have are so much more advanced and more sophisticated. And I'm just curious to know whether he would have still had the same resistance to it. But I think maybe that's misplacing what the conversation should have been. And I think he's obviously capable of going to a concert of improvised music and really enjoying it. That was not in doubt. What was in that was whether he felt that that was useful to what he was trying to do. Um, and he didn't. So anyway, he, we never had that conversation, but I wanted to. I wanted to know how, how it went for him. Yeah. What, what conversations did you have with him? Very opaque. <laughs> like, you know, oh, I really enjoyed your concert. Oh, has your, um, has your approach to your thought thinking about improvisation changed in the meantime? Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, it was, there was a, not a desire to engage, but I never had the chance to engage with him in a more private context. So it was always in, we were always, I was in packing up my instruments or sitting on the stage with him and, you know, surrounded by people with big ears. And so it, it was never going to, we were never going to have that conversation in that context. And we never had another context to have it in. So what do you think of his work looking back now? I really love an awful lot of what I hear. And, and there's so little available to listen to because he wasn't a big fan of recording music anyway. So the, for a long time, the only stuff of his I knew was the electronic stuff, Fontana mix and stuff like that. But the prepared piano, the early prepared piano work, um, I just so love that. It's so beautiful. Hard to beat. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, some of the crazy, I mean, Atlas Ellipticalis and the more crazy big scale things, uh, I think are really funny and interesting. Mm. No, I just, uh, it's a rich vein to mine. I still go back to it. I did want to ask you uh, if you have a favorite Zappa memory before we split. And this, and this. I know it's a hard I'm, question, I'm always, but it is. But I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm. This, this, this inevitably comes up, and I'm, and I, and I find myself reluctant to share it because it feels self-aggrandizing. But it's, it's, it's a thing that, that, that really stuck with me, and 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 allowed me. It, 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 it offered. It's, it's offered comfort at times in in my life when I really needed it, and it was, it was a sound check where because. I got a reputation, you know, like I wasn't a great reader or anything. And so, so the, the, where I kind of held my water in the Zappa band was the, the fact that I had a, a lot of his material uh, committed to memory because I loved it so much. So it was, it was a sort of thing where like he might say at rehearsal one day, I think I'd like to try needs the Peace Corps. That would, that would be a fun one to play. And then he would just turn and look at me and wait for me to start playing it. And then we build the arrangement out of my knowledge of the song because he didn't have any charts around. So, you know, some of those arrangements for some of those songs were kind of uh, were an outgrowth of, of my, my uh, you know, knowledge of the, of the song. So I was, I was grateful to be there for that reason, that I could bring a song, Peace Corps, back into the repertoire after 20 years. You know, that was cool. I, was, you know, it was, I, I felt like I was really earning my spot there. Uh, but then one, you know, sometimes he would catch me with, with a tune that I didn't have ready to go right away. And, and at, at one sound check, on the road, he goes, oh, I, I think I'd like to do Can't Afford No Shoes. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. And again, he just like turned and looked at me and he's like, okay, play it. And I'm like, okay. So I play the, the whole front part of the song, it was easy, right? Uh, and then it gets to the, to the, the, the I guess it's the chorus. Well, well, hey, Lonnie, mama, can't afford no shoes. Maybe there's a bundle of bags I could use. Everybody brags, not bags. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, 
there's a, a specific formula to those modulating chords, but I'd never played the song before. I was just grabbing it out of my knowledge from, from having listened to the record a million times. And up to that part of the song, it was easy enough to do because the, the leaps were not that unconventional. But once we got to that bridge or chorus, I, I hadn't yet decoded the way that, that all those chord changes work. So they, you know, they modulate all over the place. So I fucked it up. I, 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 you know, I'm trying to play it and I'm like, no, that's not it. Oh, no, no. And so immediately everybody in the band starts razzing me and Ed Mann gets on his mic. He's going like, encyclopedia failure, encyclopedia failure. And, and uh, you know, and, you know, and Frank was making fun of me and everybody was in front of me. And I'm like, you know, I, you turn into Beaver Cleaver at those moments. It's like, oh, shucks, guys, you know, uh, you know that, that kind of thing. So they, they had their moment of making fun of me and it was fine. And then at the end of the rehearsal, Frank was walking behind me as he was walking off stage. And this was so uncharacteristic of him to, to say something this sweet and supportive, but he got real close and he would just whispered, you're the best new guy I ever had in the band. And, and then he kept walking and I'm, I'm reluctant to bring it up. Like I, like I say, because it, it's, it's, you know, first of all, it's a personal thing. And, and it was a whispered comment. So there's a part of me that feels like maybe I shouldn't even share that, although I have in the past. But I, you know, I can't deny it, that that's like a moment that meant so much to me. You know, like I must have looked somewhat wounded that and, and, and he, he felt like, he, it, but that was a sweet thing for him to do. And, and I, I think it's like, it runs counter to a lot of people's image of him as, as, as a guy who just, you know, just like is only cynical. Uh, and, and I think that that showed a real sweetness and concern. And also it just made me feel so validated because I was in, in, a, in, you know, and, and he, you know, he made the point of saying new guy, because that's a, that's a different thing from just, you know, a, a guy in the band. But I think what he meant by that was just like somebody who just, just arrived and, and, and found their, their place. Um, so that was, this, this was my first professional gig. So that was in itself a, a very daunting thing, but I started my, my pro music career with the dream gig, uh, you know, because that's all I wanted when I was growing up was to play with Frank Zappa. And that's, that's, that's where I started my career. So that in itself is insane. And I definitely had moments of, of self doubt and, and just feeling like I was barely getting by. So to, to get that that degree of support and validation from Frank was, was so important to me. And as I say, there have, there have been times in life where it, being able to remember that and think back on that moment was, was extremely helpful. <laughs> you know, because if, if somebody who was as important to me as Frank, if he could feel that way, even if he felt that way in that moment, uh, it meant a lot. It still means a lot. There's a case in the middle of it, but there's that's Papa Joe's, Elvin's, Tony's. No, Tony's kit is in my. Uh, that's at my uh, storage space. Do they look? Are they look wrapped? Yeah, I got plastic on it because uh, uh, when they came back from the fire, they they wrapped it up in plastic to uh, protect it. Smart. And they um, they uh, they were in cases, but they got rid of my cases because they were smoke damaged. Right. Yeah. But the drum survived. Yeah. But I also collect guitars too. I got Holdsworth guitar down here. Can we see the Holdsworth guitar? Well, let's see. Now, this is me. It's a goat here, but you know what that is, right? Is it really? See the scallop next? Yeah, I do. That's John McLaughlin's. From One, From one tr Truth Band? One Truth Band, he also used it on the uh, uh, the uh, Cuban gig with Jocko and Tony. That's the guitar. Yeah. I saw the One Truth Band with that guitar yep. more than once. Did you? Yeah. Did you see him with Sunship? Yep. What did you think of Ship, man? He was interesting, man. He was interesting. <laughs> he was a burner. And I got to know him. Did you really? Tell me about yeah. that. Well, you know, I, uh, it's a such a mystery. Of, I was visiting. Well, actually, no, I'm sorry. I was doing a gig in L.A. with Pete Funk. Right. A friend of mine knew him. Uh, Robin. Robin. Uh, hold on. I, hold on. I'm, I'm trying to show you another guitar. I'm trying to find that Holzer guitar. 
Okay. You can uh, well my that. Name and uh, took me over to his house because I told him I'm a big fan of Sunships. So he took me over there. And Sunship opened the door, and we, you know, I went in. He was, a, he was a weird character. He had paint all over everything. Yeah. Right, here's another one. Oh, wow. This is John Schofield's guitar. Wow. How do you wind up with their guitars? Well, they gave them to me. John was done with the scallop neck and he just gave it to you? Yeah. He gave Joey a big guitar. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, a Gibson guitar. With the, the one he used with the free spirits. He gave him that one. He gave him that one. Wow. With the uh, big speed bridge, the big speed bridge on it. <laughs> Where's the Holesworth guitar? I thought I had it over here. How many guitars down there? It's like 30, I think. I got one of Jocko's basses, too. Oh, come on. Yeah. Now you're just telling tales. What? Where? How'd you get a Jocko bass? Uh, through a guy who worked on. Hold on a second. Through a guy who worked on all the Jocko's basses, and it was the guitar that he smashed in Japan. Um. Oh, here's a. Let me see. This is. Oh, that's a Paul Reed Smith. <laughs> um. <laughs> The guy, uh, uh, Miles, Miles Evans, Gil Evans, son. Yep. Supposedly had had uh, took that guitar, that bass guitar, swept it up, put it in a box, and and shipped it back or brought it back to the states, and gave the guitar to Kevin Kevin Kaufman. What is this? Oh, this is Bootsy's bass. Yeah, Bootsy's bass. <laughs> That's gorgeous. Yeah. I don't know how how Raymond tracked me down. I'll never know. Because just the phone rang and he was there. And at that time, I had a job carrying carpets, filling, putting carpets in trucks overnight, <laughs> a night shift, just to make money, enough money to live. And my, my wife was cleaning houses. So we and we were living on tea and toast. Oh yeah. So uh, I was very glad to get a call. So and was the call? The call from Ray was to start touring, right? You there were touring three friends. Uh, yeah. Uh, Raymond told me the story. He said, "Well, uh, are you doing anything at the moment?" And I said, "No, I'm carrying carpets, filling lorries overnight." And he said, "Well." Um, our drummers had a motorcycle accident, uh, broken broken a load of, load of bones, uh, and we're about to start a tour in two weeks. Mm. Do you think you could stand in for the tour? Uh, we saw you play with Graham Bond, and we, we like your playing, and we think you'd suit us. Uh, so can you, can you play with the band until uh, he gets better? And I said, yeah, sure. Whoa. He said it's a hundred pounds a week. Said, oh, that'll do me. <laughs> so when he said, "Well, can you come down to Portsmouth on the train and uh, do uh, do uh, a play along and uh, do an audition with us?" I said, "Yeah, sure." Went down. <laughs> what did he? He said, "What is this?" Da 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 I said it's a shuffle. <laughs> he said, Can you play along with it? And he did, and the phrasing came up. Da 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 ba da 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 easy. So I played that and we played a couple couple more things and um uh Alucard we played and they said great that was it. And that was, I played it on Malcolm's kit, of course. And uh, that was that. They said, yeah, good. Can you come back down and start rehearsals straight away? It's such a bizarre, uh, I mean, you want to know about Phil. I mean, Phil, well, I mean, Phil was important in this. Uh, Carrie, Carrie uh, Phil had... Um, he had a big house and he had a lodger staying with him 
who mentioned that he knew someone in a band that was stuck in Germany who went to the Royal Academy of Music and played keyboards. Um, we, we, we put ads out in, in, in English newspapers and he said, okay, who's that? And, and anyway, the bottom line is we got in touch with him. He was stuck in Hamburg or, or, or somewhere. Um, and um, it was, again, we didn't, we didn't know anything about this. This is someone who knew someone that knew someone about called Carrie Veneer. Um, and he got in touch with Carrie. Carrie called. Uh, we said, would you, when you got back in England, can you, would you like to come and audition? And we listened to Carrie and what he had and said, okay, he's, he's the guy we've been looking for for you know, a year. Um, and luckily, Phil had a very big house. You know, he could, at, at a point, we, we, we did very well in the first group. And he actually stayed with Phil for, you know, uh, certainly several, several months while we were rehearsing. Um, so that was, you know, that was the beginning of the, the band. And then we were looking for guitars, of course. Um, and uh, we, we must have uh, auditioned probably 50 to 60 of them. And, yeah, because and, now it gets dicey because the level of musicianship in the Shulman family meets the level of musicianship in the Royal Academy. Now there's a simpatico there. There's a seriousness there. Now you got to find a guitarist and a drummer. Right. Well, we we well we had uh, the drummer as a, at the last uh, very last uh, part of Cyber Dupree was a jazz drummer, Martin Smith, and Martin lived in the area. He was he was great for a certain period, uh, but more yeah, you know, and and I'll get into that in a minute. But uh, more important was was finding the right guitarist because. You know, we're a rock band. We, 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 yes, we, are uh, we a uh, uh, rock chamber music? Uh, back, I don't know, but certainly guitars in a band certainly was very important. And and Gary uh, came along with his brother, who was in the soft soft machine at that point. Uh, um, Gary, uh, and um, the first thing he said was, "Can I tune up?" And we thought, "Shit, this guy's sorry, excuse me, this, <laughs> this guy might be good because he was the first guy." that actually asked to tune up. Can you give me an E? Wow, <laughs> he's in. You know, and, and, <laughs> he got the gig. <laughs> he got the gig, but right. tune, tune up, what, what a concept, you know. Uh, but no, he, he's playing, I mean, he was a real blues player and, and, and we could tell but his licks and, and his ability on the frets and the keyboard, on the, on the as a fretboard that, man, this guy could play. Uh, and he was a little, he was a couple of years younger, but. And he was, I think, a little bit overwhelmed, but but he didn't uh, show it. Um, and I think his, after the rehearsal, and the, his brother said, "Man, you should do it. You should get get that go go for that gig." We offered him the gig, and Gentle Giant was born in 1970. Uh, so that's you know, and that was you know, basically Phil, Phil and myself were the ones auditioning and and, and leading the 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 uh, the putting together of the band effectively. And we, so that's, that was it until, uh, and I did the lyrics for the most part. Uh, Ray and Carrie would do for, for the most, most of the music, but I also wrote, contributed, you know, I'd say about 15 to 20% of the music. Um, and we started writing for the first album. So, so, so who's coming up with the initial material uh, I, I know who's arranging the initial material. I, how does the arranging process go when stuff comes in with a lot of written material? Well, um, we, you know, we, we didn't, well, one thing we did not do is jam, jam in a rehearsal. That was never happening. We didn't, you know, go into a rehearsal. Like, hey, John, you know, put, give us four to the bar and let's see, let's see what we can do. We never went in like that ever throughout the whole band's history. You know, either Ray and Carrie, and I said myself occasionally, would come up, we'd have our revoxes and we'd do sound on sound right. and um, come up with either a riff and, or, or something longer or even a kind of semi-written song. Oh, we've and heard the Carrie, we've heard the Carrie piano demos, sure. Yeah, of course. So, so and then we'll, we'll, we'd reach out to each other, you know, myself, Ray, and, 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 and Carrie, and, and fill it out. And then we bring it to the band and the band in rehearsal would fill it out even more. So, and that was, that, that was pretty much what 
how we did it for the most part all through the the, uh, the years. But but for the first album, it was really kind of like scrambling to get our sound together, which is kind of hopefully different to what we did prior to that. Um, so that's that's my story. I'm sticking to it. So you guys were doing three hour shows. How well, did you? Three, three, three and a half. How did you prepare physically for that? It's I was young. I didn't know. Ah. I just thought that's how that's how that's how it is. So you know, God gave me the strength to do it, and uh, but I have always been strong anyway. Um, even the marching band in high school, you march with that snare drum seven miles. That stuff makes you strong, you know. So. I was so happy to have a job playing with Mavish and Show. My God, that is just, it's just the time flew by. The time flew by. And I had to learn secrets because Ma Mavish might say, well, you know, you had to listen more, right? Listen, because this whole thing was listening. And I, watch, I learned to kind of watch his body. I often tell the story about watching his body really helped me because he's played so beautifully and his body would move like this. When his body would get this little move on, I would encourage that movement, whatever it would do to make that movement can grow like blowing a fire. You know, like keeping this fire, keeping this fire, keeping this fire, and then that fire would just, then rock would get so strong on him that the that the, again the the, the 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 nose would be like bullets flying, just flying with so much intensity, and cry like he's speaking to everybody his love of God, his love of the universe, his love of humanity, and so I would just do whatever I could just to support him, and those would be the shows he would say you were you were great tonight. So I had to learn that, I had to learn that. I had to learn that, yeah. But I also wanna say two more things. My guru was very instrumental. He said to me, do, do not compete with Billy Cobham. You know, compete with yourself. You know, be the best of you. But do not compete with Billy Cobham because you, you can never be or compete with Billy Cobham. None but, of us can. Yeah, but, but compete with yourself. So that was something I had to really pray on, meditate on. And that helped me a lot. And then Vishnu would say things to me like this, which horse is stronger? The horse that can run down the mountain the fastest or the horse that can run periodically and stop on the way down the mountain? And I would say, the horse that can stop periodically down the way might say, you're right. Yeah. Uh -huh. The power of restraint. The power of restraint. The power of restraint. So he, he was talking like that all the time. Then, before going on stage, What's he listening to in his Sennheiser headphones? Elvin Jones and John Colton going at it, hardcore. You could hear it. This is how he got hot for the show. It was either they made that or some intense Indian music. But nine out of 10 times, it'd be Elvin Jones burning. And we walk on the stage. I had the pleasure Put that of having pipe of smoke. <laughs> Put that pipe of smoke. Yeah, seriously, because <laughs> when I hung out with with Joseph and Anthony from from the crew, you know, Anthony yeah. Barone and yeah. Joseph Dana, they said they were in a car with Mahavishnu one time and he's playing Coltrane on the cassette player. And they're saying, John, what is this? And he said, this is what I'm trying to do. And they had thought he was trying to do Hendrix, but that's part of it. But really the Coltrane Elvin thing, I always thought of that, that relationship between the drummer and the soloist. You carried that over from Billy, but you carried that over from Elvin and, and Train. I was very inspired by all of it. And, and just again, playing what I felt would inspire Mahavishnu. That was my whole love of life to do whatever it took to inspire him. Yeah, that was my whole thing in life. The whole thing. And the approach too is 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 something that, that we talk about. We talked about endurance, but I think another thing that's really important to play that music is relaxation. It's like Vinny said when he turned me on to, to Bruce Lee and his writings, he said, you know, when Bruce Lee does this, he can't, he said, Bruce Lee said, I can't do that quick move unless I'm relaxed. Uh -huh. Now, obviously there's a lot of pressure too that can go into things and, and there's a lot of uh, concussion in what we do, but there's a lot of grace that has to go into it or you're not gonna make it. And you gotta be dynamic, right? You gotta be musical, you gotta listen. 
there's so many different pistons that are firing while you're doing that music. Mm -hmm. I did my very best to warm up on a on a nice thick rubber pad in the dressing room before I go on. Just to have my little exercise to kind of get myself loose. Because once the thing hit, it was on. And once I broke a sweat, then it didn't matter anymore. And I realized a few things, which I'll share with you, that I, I'm asking God to come through me. I'm asking God, I'm asking God to come through and play me. I'm asking God to come through and be and be the be the be the, the source and I'm gonna be the instrument. So then that takes that takes me out of the picture a bit. I'm focusing on the high, the high side. And then I've also learned not to judge because the mind can play a trick and say, well, tonight I was great or tonight I wasn't very great. But I've learned this, that, okay, tonight, tonight I played pretty good, I feel. But then from the highest standpoint, God may say, it was all right. <laughs> but then you turn it around and say, well, tonight I wasn't very good at all. And God will say, no, tonight was your best because something you did tonight save someone in the audience that was about to commit suicide, you inspired them to want to live. You won't know that from your, from your perspective, but I can see it. So that's why I've had to learn not judge. But as a guitarist, as a musician, what were you vibing on at that point? I think it was just the, uh, the sheer power of it. From those opening Mellotron chords from Watcher in the Skies onwards, it's it's perfectly paced as well. You know, it's, it starts with this huge impact, uh, but then it leads you into uh, the more gentle stuff and takes you on a little trip. And that's the difference between a, a, a good album and a great album. When you get the sequencing right and all the dynamics work as a whole, you know, you put the thing on and for the next 20 minutes, you are sat in your chair absorbing this ex listening experience. And that's what it did. And uh, of course, the, the softer stuff wasn't as immediate. But over time, it, it just it, it just works its way into the into the synapses. And and you become I became addicted to it. It's one of those records that I did become addicted to. And I'd have to I'd come home from work and have to put it on just to get a daily fix. And uh, well, we all know the majesty of Supper's Ready. Even to, to this day, people still. Uh, rated, you know, the prog heads will put it in the top five of greatest mu music ever made by a pop group. And uh, I wouldn't argue for that with that for a second, because it is phenomenal. It's just full of full of interesting twists and turns, all of which work. There's no spare flesh on it, even though it's 23 minutes long. Everything in it is there for a purpose and it works beautifully. So true. I, I it was more than just, uh, and it was another record that I wouldn't say it was a guitar player's record because there aren't any real sort of standout solos on it. All the guitars are there doing a brilliant job, especially the lovely arpeggiating 12 string guitars. I, I love that sound, and they, they really championed that idea and, uh, and, 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 and really ran the whole nine yards with it. I love that sound. I love the technique involved and uh, this sort of gentle finger picking and, and it was beautifully captured and put on tape in such a way that it was, it, it created a sort of certain magic that wasn't, that nobody else was really doing at that time in, in rock. It was a folk technique, mm. but because it was a rock in a rock context, it, it, it took it to another level. So I'm not really, really making myself clear. I, I do struggle trying to explain why music works for me. I just I really want to just sit down and say, here's the record, go and listen to it. You might agree, you might disagree, but that's my advice. Go, go play the record. Did you get to hear the live band at that time, around that time? I heard them once. Uh, when they were promoting uh, the following album, Selling England, and they did a British tour in October, November 1973. And they did a, an early show at the Hippodrome in Bristol. And we were determined, you know, that, right, we cannot miss Genesis this time. We must go see them. And they were great. It was fantastic. It was just, they put on a great show. We just, I think that, I think the album had been released 
and we were you know buzzing on that and, and just getting getting into them getting used to the new material and they played a couple of songs from selling england and then they they did all the fan favorites and of course they did suppers ready and yeah it was a magical night it was really really great es established jazz magazines would always avoid his name you'd never you i mean it was many years before you saw anything at all reviewed in downbeat i remember i i mean i and i remember something in their defense which they claim was was um was like uh because this is not a jazz musician he's a rock guitar player with a rock sound but what they couldn't figure out behind this unbelievably bigoted and blinkered point of view was the actual sustain was there for him to get a musical effect. He wanted those, he wanted to be able to control degrees of sustain because he loved the saxophone so much. We all know these stories, but this was the reason he didn't even like sustain. You know, I mean, he, he throughout periods in the nineties, you could hardly hear any overdrive whatsoever. It was so subtle. And he tried to, to, to refine it as much as he could without it sounding blazingly overdriven. But for, for a magazine to sort of say, uh, uh, you know, well, we're not going to review, this is not jazz, that's a rock sound, so therefore he's a rock musician. I mean, how ignorant is that? Uh, and I was always very anti-establishment, you know, when it came to the, I thought that was just disgusting that they would ignore him because of his sound, I mean, you hear what's going on? I mean, John Coltrane would be going, wow, I never imagined that was possible. You know, I mean, it's that height. And I'm, I'm happy for the, you know, for the record to always say that Alan is a post Coltrane player. He's yeah. important as a Coltrane devotee, but also as a person who just brought it to another level, regardless of the instrument. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, I knew, I mean, obviously working second, with Steve Hunt for a long time as I did and, and you did as well. Yeah. I mean, I just, yeah. I knew what you guys talked about. I knew what Alan was into. I knew his favorite Coltrane solo was, um, was from Coltrane yeah. sound satellite. You no, know, no. I, I knew, I knew that the, the syntax was important to him for the reason that you just mentioned about, having control over the shape of the envelope of the note, having control yeah. over that, you know, I mean, he's even doing flutter tonguing uh, on that, that tube at some point, you know, just, I know. Of, I, so here's what I w really wanted to say is that um, I really feel like Alan suffered for his art. Mm. I think he did. I think he needed to suffer, but I think he, that was in him as a human. There we go. This thing you play as you are again. Uh, and that all tied in with the fact that he was reluctant and often denied himself possibilities to, to do better. I always thought of him, and not surprisingly, since he was the person that introduced me to, to this figure, I always thought of him as a Nikola Tesla figure. Yeah, great inventor. Never happier than in his in his little workroom and putting together a new box, you know, that's going to facilitate this or do this or run this channel in a different way or, you know, house, uh, produce his sound in a different way simply because where it's put in a container and what shape that is and what it's made out of. And a relentless experiment, of course. It's rubbed joyful. Did, did you have uh, any particular difficult pieces with the Zappa book that, that really kicked your butt? <laughs> I think To Mercy Duane just always kicked my butt. <laughs> it was hard for me to play that without counting out loud, you know? <laughs> I just did not naturally feel fives and things. I mean, now, yeah, not so much a big deal, but in those days, man, it, it, I had to really stay alert. It was, um, you know, and just, just speaking to the whole practice thing, uh, that was my introduction to 40 hour week rehearsals. And, you know, people people still seem amazed at that. If you haven't done a major tour with a major artist, 
most local bands can't afford to do 40 hour work rehearsals because people got to work or whatever. And even though we weren't getting paid a lot for it, we were getting paid for rehearsing. And with Genesis, it was the same thing. We always did 40 hour week rehearsals. Um, so weather report, not so much. We never rehearsed less than six hours a day though. Um, they didn't want it, but so tight. You know, you don't want to lose that thing. And the worst thing you could do with those guys was we play the same show exactly twice. That, oh, that was a kiss of death. You know, no, it's not that kind of music, you know. And um, so, but basically my first month, uh, rehearsal was from 11 to seven. So basically Napoleon and I stayed in the same little motel. So we quickly got a routine together. Uh, we rehearsed from 11 to seven, left rehearsal. We usually walk, there was a little couple of places we would have dinner at one or the other. Go to the hotel, watch, you know, stay up until Groucho, you, you bet your life, Groucho Monster. Go to bed, I'd wake up about three in the morning and practice for a couple of hours and I'd hear the saxophone crank up across the other side of the motel. I'm, I'm surprised they didn't kick us out. So I'm banging on the bed, he's playing his horn and, you know, and singing stuff and uh, go back to sleep. Wake up at about uh, 8.39 go get breakfast and go back to rehearsal. This was this was a daily routine, you know. For how long? For a month. You know, we took weekends off. We, you know, we worked Monday through Friday. But in Saturday and Sunday, man, I was practicing. It was like not a whole lot of going out and doing stuff. So, you know, because that, that book, man, it was, you know, once, you know, once I got into it, you know, say a year or two, you know, a year and a half in, then, I didn't have to put in those same kind of hours, but I could never back off the, the preparation. You know? well, same, thing, same thing with Genesis. I mean, Genesis was heavy on our, our time, so, certainly not at, on the order of Zappa, but um, they only gave me nine days to rehearse with that first tour. Oh. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, they never had to rehearse anybody. I mean, Bruford did the first tour, but him and Phil knew each other for years, apparently. And they were auditioning singers up until the last minute. They didn't find a singer for the album. Then they were still auditioning singers for the tour. And when it was, you know, when they realized, okay, Phil's now the singer, they desperately had to reach out and I guess Bill, you know, Bill was close enough and Bill had played enough prog rock. So, you know, it kind of, he was able to jump right in. The following year, they just were not used to like, you know, I mean, they, they would bring them the songs together and explain them as they went. None of those, none of those guys did music, by the way. So yeah, the, those were all head. I mean, they just talked the tunes down. You know. You never saw any sheet music with Genesis. I wrote it. <laughs> Somewhere in my possession, if I still have it, is a little notebook with every note Phil ever played on all the early stuff, all the early prog rock stuff, and. Um, so, you know, they sent me cassettes and all to listen to, but it just, it didn't really compute. So once we got there, after the first day, I said, okay, guys, in order for this to work, if you can give me a list of songs for the next day, I'll be ready. So I literally stayed up until three and four in the morning transcribing all of Phil's parts and, and going through them at rehearsal. So they were pretty amazed because they'd never seen anybody pull out a little book and play that and play the stuff down. But that was the only way I could get it down, you know? Um, I, I, I do know because I played that music for uh, seven or eight years in a group mm -hmm. from Canada called the Musical Box. Mm -hmm. and when I got the gig, I did the same thing you did, which is I wrote down all of Phil's parts. We should uh, we should exchange sheet music <laughs> at some point. <laughs> well, like I said, unfortunately, I have no idea where that little book of manuscript paper is. I mean, it wasn't even full size paper. It was just a little, you know, half half sheet size thing. And um, yeah, it, it was, uh, but again, that, for those nine days, it was supposed to be 10 days, but they thought it was going well, so they took Sunday off. And I'm, I'm panicking, it's like, what? You can't take any time off, you know? And then to make it so, what made it even worse, so rehearsals were probably October going into November, November actually, but we didn't tour. The first gig wasn't until January 1st. And um, so basically I had, three weeks, maybe a month off, and I had to go back to England a couple of days of touch-up rehearsals and then start the first gig. I've recently come across recordings of the first, those for, at first weekend. And the first night is pretty rough. The next two nights it came together uh, pretty good, if I say so myself. But that first night was, oh my goodness. You know? 